OK, then. OK, can everyone hear me OK? Yes. Great, thank you very much. So, welcome to lecture two of data acquisition and experimental methods. I can see you all very excited, which is good to see. A uh, couple of things to note. Uh, unfortunately, the online timetable system was slightly inaccurate. So, I've updated uh, lecture one slides, particularly this slide. And that was just mainly around when the Easter breaks are and when the activities are. I don't think it will change anything with your timetable, but just if you did download the slides from last week's lecture, this is the one that's changed, okay? And I've done that both in the PowerPoint file and in the PDF. So thank you to those who have engaged with the online materials. I had a look last night and probably around 60% of you have engaged with the materials so far. We're in week two, lots of stuff to engage with. You're gonna get left behind pretty quickly if you're not engaging and you're not coming to the lectures. Okay, um, so there's a bit of feedback recap from blended learning materials. Uh, and just based on last week, and uh, I can hear a few people talking now, just so you know, I don't mind you talking so long as it's outside of the lecture theater. If I do see you talking today, I'll give you one warning, and after that, I'll ask you to leave, okay? So you have been warned, okay? It's just it's quite distracting for everybody else. So thanks for those people who completed the uh, feedback of what you'd like to look at. So what, from week one, so one of the things was about this idea of coercion points, so let's have a look at that. So can anybody tell me what the dark blue data type represents? What does dark blue represent? What type of number? It's an integer, yeah. It's an integer number for the dark blue. And the, the orange ones? What are oranges? Double precision. So they're the floating points. They're non-integer numbers, and it means that they can have a positive or a negative value. Okay? And the 32-bit, which means they can hold 2 to the power of 32 values that you can store in that. Now, what we can see here if I can use my little uh, pointer thing, is that going to work? Here we go. What we can see is this little red dot here. That little red dot there is called a coercion dot, and it indicates when you've got a data mismatch. So it's saying to you here, in this mathematical function that we put down, an, an, an addition block, it's adding two types of data, but the data types don't match. And this is a problem in programming when the data, data types don't match, but it takes extra additional computational overhead to correct that. And if you're trying to do a high speed application, so you're trying to get these calculations done at a really high speed to a high loop frequency, and we're looking at timing of VIs today, then this will cause you problems, okay? So you'd need to correct for that error, but it's indicated by the coercion dot. What the program's doing in this in instance is it's going to convert the integer number into a double precision before it adds those two double precision numbers together. So that's what we meant by coercion dots. The other bit of feedback from week two was a little bit more on part two of DAQ. So let's have a look at a few fundamental parts. This is a really important slide. Okay? It's really important because it explains several key concepts between analog signals discrete time tick signals and digital signals. So let's start with an analog signal. So the waveform that we can see here, yeah, the gray line that we can see on the slide, if it'll work for me, rubbish cursor, okay. The gray line that you can see there, that is a continuous time signal. At any point in time, okay, you can pick any fraction, or you could have 1.37495 seconds, you could go along to that point, you could go up, and you could read what that value was. Okay? So it's, it's what we call a continuous time signal. Okay? If we take that point, if we take that continuous time signal, and we make it into a discrete time si signal, that means that we're just going to sample it at a regular frequency. And the frequency that we're sampling it in this instance here is once per second. And that's represented by the red, uh, red blobs. Okay, so I'm sampling this continuous time signal once per second. And I get the values, well, naught it's naught, 
Then I've got a value of four, then five, then four, then three, then four, then six, then seven, and so on. So I've gone from a continuous time signal into what we call a discrete time signal. And this is the basis of pretty much everything that we do in computers, because all computers are digital. So real systems in the real world that we do for data acquisition, they're not continuous time. They're in discrete and they're digital systems. So that's my discrete time signals. If I take each of those numbers then, so if I take the first value of zero, or I take the first value, let's choose four, at, at time t equals one second, I've got a value of four. To take that discrete time signal and represent it as a digital signal, I'm going to use a four-bit representation of a number, which gives me two to the power four values, okay, which means I can do naught to 15 if I count naught as one of my values. Then the representation of the number four is zero, one, zero, zero. So I've taken, and if I do that for each of these red blobs, for each of these numbers, I end up with this very bottom line here, which is a load of zeros and ones. All those zeros and ones are a, a digital representation of the discrete time capture of that continuous time signal. And that's pretty fundamental for the course, okay? If I just imagine that as doing it as highs or lows, that, dig that uh, continuous time waveform there is represented just on a graph like this, okay? And you could then write a program, okay, so you could take that signal, you could make it discrete time, you could make it into a digital signal, and then you could take a single wire and you could tap on and off to somebody on the other side of the uh, room, and they could take those signals and record them, and they could decode that, and then they get the, continue, uh, they get the discrete time representation of it again. This is the fundamental basis of all telecommunication systems, okay? with that concept around continuous time, discrete time, and digital signals. Now, we don't have to use a four-bit number, because four bits, two to the power uh, four, okay, which is 16 values, not great. We want a higher resolution, right? So we'll use a high, two to the power 32 is a lot larger. Okay, so that's one important concept from last week. The other one was this idea of a deterministic system. Basically, if you want to put it really simply, a deterministic system is one that will do what you tell it to do every single time. My laptop, your laptops, are not deterministic systems. Because when you're trying to do something and you've got a movie on in the background and then your virus checker in the background, your, your CPU is going to prioritise different tasks. Whereas when we're doing data acquisition, we want it to do that data acquisition task every time that we set it to do. So if I set it at a loop, and I want my loop to run at um, 10,000 hertz, I need to know that it's going to run and execute 10,000 times per second. My PC won't do that performance. Okay? A deterministic system will do that. And the way we achieve that is with some dedicated software, but more importantly, some dedicated specialist hardware to do that. Okay? And they're also usually linked to deterministic system, usually uses something called an FPGA, which is called a field programmable gate array. So that was another key concept. Last key concept from, the, from this uh, slide then. So non-buffered single sample data. So on the left hand side is a value that I've pulled from my sensor. Okay, let's say I've got a temperature sensor here and I'm gonna put it on the desk over here and I'm gonna attach it to my computer. And what it's saying is I'm going to set up my loop and I'm going to measure that value maybe 10 times per second. So every time it takes a measurement, it sends it to my computer. And it's going to do that 10 times per second. Okay? This is a Mac. It's pretty good performance. Okay? 10 times per second, no problems. 10,000 times per second is going to have a problem. So one of the ways of capturing high-speed uh, high frequency signals, okay, so when you want to do high speed data acquisition, one of the ways to do that if you don't have a really high performance PC is to do something called buffered input output. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to store a load of values here in a buffer and then periodically I'm going to send them all over to the computer once I carry on making my measurements, okay? 
And the system can cope with that, but it can't cope with sending them all over the bus really, really quickly. Okay? That's the idea of single sample or non-buffered input-output or buffered input-output. Now, the problem with buffered, okay, is if you're trying to do control. What is control? I want to read a signal from something, okay, like the position of my aircraft, and then I want to apply a signal to my control surfaces of my aircraft to get it to do something. If I'm buffering up, like several seconds worth of data, that means I'm going to have several seconds worth of delay before I affect my aircraft, which just isn't going to work for an aircraft um, control system, isn't it? We want to do it in what we call real time, so pretty instantaneously. Okay, so those were some key concepts. Um, you'll have to excuse me, I have the flu, um, so if my voice goes halfway through, my apologies. Come and ask me questions at the end, but do keep your distance. You don't want this virus, it's awful. Okay, so now we're going to look at timing of VI. So we've just talked about doing data acquisition really quickly and the importance of speed. And the question is, in LabVIEW, how quick does a virtual instrument, a VI, run? And how can we set it to run at a speed that we would like it to? So, <coughs> why do you need timing in a VI? That's to control the frequency at which the loop executes. Okay, so I could set it to run at 10 hertz, 100 hertz, 1000 hertz, and so on and so forth. It also provides the processor with time to complete other tasks such as processing the user interface. Okay, so if you just don't put a timing function in your VI, it's going to run as quick as possible, but it's not going to run in a regular pattern because other things will slow down the PC. Okay? And we want it to run in that pattern. So giving it an amount of time really helps the system to manage its computational overhead. Let's look at that then. So this is just a, a virtual instrument uh, that we've set up here. Does anybody know what this structure is around the outside? What's that grey gray box? Is this a, a for loop or a while loop? Who thinks it's a for loop? Put your hands up. Who thinks it's a while loop? Okay, and lots of people who need to look at week one and two materials, yeah? Okay, the answer is it's a while loop. And I know it's a while loop for a couple of reasons. The top left-hand corner of my grey box, there's no end there. If it was a for loop, there'd be an end there, and I'd be wiring how many times for it to run. Instead, I've got this little green box with a red stop sign in it, and that's what we call a condition terminal. And this program will stop executing when a true value is wired to that red stop sign. And what do we have here? We have an OR gate, okay? So I've got an OR gate, and programmatically, I've got this thing called Enable, which is actually a button on the front of my VI, of the front panel. So I can stop my VI by pressing that on the front panel. Or it's going to stop when the little die, which represents a random number generator, when that value is greater than or equal to... 0.9, in which case that uh, greater than or equal is going to become true. My OR gate says if one of those are true, output true, and then the loop's going to stop. But how quickly does this loop run? It's going to run as quick as possible. And I can add a timing function for my um, uh, functions palette, such as a wait number of milliseconds, and I can then wire a number to it to set the frequency that the loop's going to run at. And this is really important. Your other options are to add something like a wait until next uh, milliseconds multiple, which we're not going to go into much detail. And some advice for you, don't use the higher level LabVIEW functions, so the Express VI timing functions. They won't really work and they'll give you problems in your code. So we're going at a lower level of programming for this uh, course. Let's have a little bit, look at a bit of an example of that then. Hello. Oh, no, I'm just, just switching on to LabVIEW. So it, it takes a couple of seconds. That's okay. Okay, so here's my VI. Here's my code that we can see up here. Okay, I've got to wait until... Are we okay?
okay? Okay. So what we can see here is we've got our uh, random number generator. We're going to display that to the front panel. It's a while loop again because I've got my little stop sign and I've got a, a stop button on the front panel. I've got the little I, which is the iteration terminal, which is just going to tell me how many times my loop is executed. And I've also got a timing function. And at the moment, I've wired zero to it. So it's going to wait zero milliseconds. So let's go to my front panel. These are the numbers here. Let's run the VI. And you can see it runs pretty quickly. The time period between each time it runs is not consistent. And that's the problem that we're trying to address. So if we go to my block diagram, let's make this 500, which means it's going to wait 500 milliseconds between iterations. Let's run the program again, and you'll see now that this is updating every half a second. So we've programmatically set the frequency at which this loop is running at. So that's how we time the VI, and that's going to become more important, especially in the group project. Okay, let's look at the next concept then. So the next concept is called iterative data transfer. And what we're talking about here is, when my program, say I've got a loop, and the loop has just done some function and some code, and it's given me an answer, and I want to keep that answer for the, the next time that the loop runs. That's all we're trying to do. We're trying to pass information from the previous loop execution to the current one, because we may want to use it for something. So that's what we're talking about. So when a program with loops, you often need to know the values of the data from previous iterations. So we can see here, shift registers, okay, transfer values from one loop iteration to the next. And the shift register that we can see here, we can see on the edge of our for loop, and I know it's a for loop because the top left hand side, there's a number n, and there's a 2y to it, which means that the loop is going to execute twice. On the edge of that, on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, I have these little blue boxes with an upside-down triangle in. That is called a shift register. And this is just a single shift register. Let me explain to you how this code is going to operate. The first thing is, before the, loop, uh, the, the for loop starts, it's going to say, I'm going to execute twice. And then the first time it executes, the shift register on the left is initialized to a value of 1, because I've put a constant on there and I've wired it to it. So the first time it executes, a value of 1 is going to go in there. And then that 1's going to go through to the plus, and it's going to be 2 plus 1, and it's going to go out of the right-hand side of my plus um, function to the other side of the shift register. And that value of 3 is going to be stored. The loop's then going to execute the second time. And the value that was stored on the right-hand side is now going to appear on the left-hand side of that shift register. So in the last loop, a value of 3 went into the right-hand side. This time it executes, a value of 3 is going to come out of it. So it's going to do 3 plus 2, which is 5. The loop has now completed two iterations, so it's going to finish. And a value of 5 is going to pass out and be presented to output. So that's the concept of a shift register. And we're going to look at an example in a second. This looks more complex. Wouldn't this make a nice MCQ question? Okay. This is not one shift register. This is two separate shift registers. So you can have more than one shift register. I know it's two separate shift registers because I can see two lots of uh, blue boxes with upside down triangles and they're not all next to each other. Okay, so I've got two shift registers. You can add multiple shift registers into your program. So that's one shift register, and that's the second shift register. And both of them have been initialized on the left-hand side there with different numeric values for the start of that program. Let's do a question then. And this is all about shift registers and the importance of initializing values in shift registers. Those folk who have done text-based programming will understand the importance of initializing your variables at the start of your program. So, what's going to happen? The first time this program runs, well, we've just done it, and we've said the output will be 5. Right? Okay. So, I've just run my program, and it stopped. 
And then I go away, I make a cup of tea, I come back, and I run my program again. What's the output this time? Is it the same? Yeah, it's the same, because I've initialized my shift register. It does 1 plus 2 is 3, the second time as it runs, 3 plus 2 is 5, and I get an output of 5. Now, what about in this instance? The difference between the top piece of LabVIEW code and the bottom piece of LabVIEW code is I've not initialized my shift register. So on the bottom, there's going to be no value in there. And when there's no value in there and you don't tell it what value it's going to be, it assumes that a value of zero is there. Okay? And these numbers are stored in a piece of memory. So when you start this code, it assigns a piece of memory to store that value. So it's going to say it's zero. So we get 0 plus 2, output of 2. The next time it runs, 2 plus 2, the output is 4. Okay? Does anybody know or can guess what the next time it runs is? I've gone and made my cup of tea. I've come back. I've run it again. What's it going to output this time? 8. It is 8. Why is it 8? Yeah, exactly. So here's my piece of memory, right? And the first time it ran... It stored a value of 4 there. And that value of 4 is still there because you've not initialized it. So when you run the code again now, it's going to do 4 plus 2 is 6. 6 plus 2 is 8. Okay? So the importance of initializing um, shift registers and data transfer between loops. Let's have a look at something different. The previous one used integers. We can have a shift register which is a different colour. This is an orange one, so it's double precision, which means I've got non-integer numbers in there. Okay, so like 3.75, for example. Okay, this is one shift register. And I know that it's one shift register because if I look at the right-hand side, there's only one output for the shift register. On the left-hand side, I've got multiple boxes. Does anybody have a guess why there might be multiple boxes there? What do we think? Anyone? Go on, sir. Yeah. That's right, yeah. So when it runs, the top one's going to be the previous value. The one below it is going to be the value before that. The one below it the one before that, the one below it, the one before that. So it's storing not just the last, the data from the last iteration, but from the ones, each of the ones back. Okay? So you can do it and you can set it up. So what this function, this program does, okay, is it's going to, it's going to create a random number inside the loop. Okay? It's a, it's a, a while loop, so it's going to, when you start it, it's going to run until I press stop on my front panel. So it's going to keep running. And it's going to generate a random number each time. And then it's going to add that random number to the previous four values and then divide by five and plot the data. Okay? When you run this VI, and the VI is on Blackboard for you to have a go with, okay, it's going to show you the original data points and then it's going to show you a line. And effectively what you're doing is you're smoothing out the data. So this is a really simple way of taking data which might have noise in it and smoothing it out so you can see the pattern underneath it. Let's have a look at that in LabVIEW. Okay, so iterative data transfer. There we go. Okay, so this is just the example from the previous one, and all I'm showing is I've got two loops. The top loop, it's initialized my value to my shift register. The bottom one, I've not initialized it. So if I run it, we'll just see the results of that to prove our answer. So we've got a five and we've got a four. Okay.
So our next, our next concept that we've got, LabVIEW troubleshooting and debugging. I have to speed up a little bit. So troubleshooting and debugging. When I'm on the front panel, this is really handy. If I go to help, context help, this little window pops up. And every time I hover over something on my block diagram with my cursor, it shows me how that works. Okay? So I'm hovering over with, at the moment, this thing that's called read from spreadsheet file. So if I've got a spreadsheet in LabVIEW, I can set it up programmatically to access that spreadsheet, collect the data, and, and process it somehow, which is really quite, quite a powerful thing to be able to do. And I'll, I'll give you another example of that later in the course, or maybe at the end if I've got time. Another way that you can get help in LabVIEW is you can go to LabVIEW and help and access the help menu. And in the help menu, you'll find um, detailed descriptions of most palettes, menus, tools, VIs, and functions and instructions for using LabVIEW. And you can get to that by selecting help, search the LabVIEW help, and use the detailed help link in the context help window. So the context help window, if you hover over something, you can click a button which says detailed help and it gives you far more information. So a really handy way for you all whilst you're learning LabVIEW about how each of these functions work. This is the example finder. So there's many, many different examples. If you go to the example finder, you can type in what you're looking for. Maybe you want to take an array and change the elements in it. Maybe you want to be able to read a data sheet. It will give you examples of how to do that piece of code. It's a really useful thing to be able to, to access. Let's, let's look at debugging programs then. So how do we fix broken VIs? So as we said in our last lecture that we had the other week, when I want to run my program, I click the little white arrow at the top of my VI. If the arrow looks like that, a broken arrow, that means there's an error in the code. Okay, and my VI isn't going to run. And when I click on that, a little window opens up. And that window tells me what the errors are. Okay, and if you click on each of them, you double click on it, it will show you where on your code the error is. Okay, so for those folk that have done text-based programming, this is really quite handy, right? When you've got a big, long program, you're trying to find the errors. This helps you to identify exactly where the errors are pretty quick. Not all of the time, as you'll discover in the group project. But here it lists what the problems are. You have connected two terminals of different types. So that's a problem. The second error, the while loop, the conditional terminal is not while. So really helpful. Let's have a look at an example of this. The error that we've got here is I've connected two controls to each other. So I've got something on the front panel which lets me enter data, and I've got something else on the front panel which lets me enter data, and I've connected the two together. Well, you can't do that. You can't have two things creating data wired to each other. You can create data, and then you can look at that data. So with a, with a, um, a control and an indicator. So that's the error that we've got here, and the wire is broken, and there's a cross through it to say, you've done something wrong, Andy. So um, what do you do if your VI isn't broken, but you are getting unexpected data or behavior? Okay, so this is about you know, software verification okay, to understand. So things to check for, are there any unwired or hidden sub-VIs? Because sometimes if you don't wire something to something else in LabVIEW, it won't stop you from running the program, but your program won't run with the correct logic. <coughs> Incorrect default data being used. Undefined data being passed. Numeric representation correct, so we talked about that a little bit earlier. Node execution order correct, so the order in which it's going to execute things, that may be problems. So debugging techniques then, how do we fix programs that aren't working? You can use this thing called execution highlighting. So here we can see a VI, and this VI is just taking two numbers, it's adding them together and presenting the answer, and it's taking the two numbers and it's subtracting them, and it's showing the answer. Okay, so it's just doing two things here. And it's doing it, and we can see that our VI is running because the white arrow is black, so we can see that the VI is running. If I click on the little light bulb, okay, so when I haven't clicked on the out bulb, it looks like on the left-hand side, when I do click on it to switch on execution highlighting, it illuminates. And what that then shows you is how the data is passing through the loop. And we'll have a look at that in, in a few minutes. Okay? So it's generating the data, it's going to show you the values, and it's going to show you with a little dot that moves along the wires how the data is flowing through your VI. So you can check it's flowing in the correct way that you would like it to. You can also add stop points in that. So you can get your code, and you can create a probe in there to show you what your values are, 
or you can set a set point. So your code will execute until that point and then it will stop. And then using these buttons, it will let you click through the next functions. So you can do it by step by step. So once you've got to that point, there might be an add thing, you'll click it and it'll do add. Then there might, you might be doing a subtract function, so you click it and go through subtract. So you can see the data flow and you can check the values to see if that's working or not. So let's look at an example of debugging a VI. Okay, so this is my VI that I can see here. Let's just make that a little bit larger for you. Here we go. Move these over here. So here we can see, here's this broken arrow sign that shows that I've got problems. If I click on that, it's going to tell me I've got a couple of problems. So let's click on them. For loop, n is not wide. If I double click on that, look, it's saying, look, here, we're talking about this for loop over here, and look, I've forgotten to wire my numeric value to my for loop, so I can just wire that up, if it'll let me, there we go, I'm not sure why it's doing that, let's just create a new constant, and delete that one, Doesn't like that, so we've set that to run there, what's my next error, let's click on that, you have collected two terminals of the incorrect type. And we'll look at them later in the course. What my, remember, data can't come out of a loop until the loop is finished. And what I've asked this loop to do is execute 20 times. Because the, the, um, the, um, the small orange square, okay, the tunnel, as we call them in LabVIEW, that is a solid orange color, which means it's only going to output the last value. Okay, so it's, the loop's going to run on the 20th value it's going to output. And what I'm, what I'm plotting there is I'm sending it to a waveform graph which tries to plot an array of data. So if I right click here on my tunnel and I go to tunnel mode indexing, you'll see how the solid orange has gone to an orange parentheses. And now that parentheses is going to store all of the values in that loop and then output them all at once. So it's going to store up 20 values and then I'm going to plot my 20 values. Okay. And now it's saying my VI will run. But look, this indicates that there's still a problem. In my top VI over here, I've not wired my random number generator to my waveform chart. Okay, so it illustrates that whilst the debugging tool is handy, it doesn't cover all of the errors that you may get. And then when I run this VI, window show front, show front panel. Let me make this a little bit larger and scroll up a little bit we can see that executing. Okay, so three different types. A waveform chart that we use inside a loop to look at data, a waveform graph to look at all the data afterwards, and an XY graph where we can plot X values against Y values. All these VIs are on online for you to have a play with after the lecture. Hello. Uh, <laughs> Could you say that again so I can't hear you? Yes, so it, it, that, that, um, that tunnel will store all of the data, so you don't have to write that data anywhere, and it, as long as your LabVIEW program is running and it doesn't abort, it will store thousands, tens of thousands of values. So you just have to wire it there, put the parentheses, and it will store that data for you. It can do that dynamically. Yeah. Yeah, so long as, it, so long as you've set, set it to indexing, it will store as much data as you want up until some crazy number that I've never reached. Yeah, good question. Okay, so we've done debugging VIs. <coughs> I'll have to go a little bit quicker, but this just illustrates here, at the point one and the point two, all I've done is I've gone to insert a probe and put a probe at that point and what that means is when my VI is running it's just going to come up with this little probe uh, window which is just going to show you the values that are currently being measured okay so we can use probes 
the probe tool, so that's the indicator on the front panel that you would see. Uh, retain values in the wires so you can keep that so you can retain them and look after the VI has finished. Uh, so when you reach a breakpoint, so we talked about the idea of reaching a breakpoint. So you can right click on a wire, insert a breakpoint, and like we said, it will stop at that point, and then you can use these other functions. So you can take the following actions at a breakpoint. You can single step through the execution using the single stepping button, so you can click through all the next steps. Or you can probe wires to check intermediate values, so you can check what's happening in the code. And you can chain values on the front panel controls to see what's happening. And just something to note for you, when you're doing your coursework and when you're doing stuff where you want it to run at a certain speed, once you're debugging it with execution highlighting, switch off your execution highlighting. Otherwise, it will stop your program from running at the correct speed. So great for debugging, but make sure that you switch it off afterwards. Okay. You can click the pause button or continue running to the next breakpoint or until the VI finishes running. So what do you do? Um, <coughs> unexpected data, infinity, so have you divided the number by zero? That will give you a value of infinity. Uh, nan, or not a number, okay? Produced by invalid operations such as taking the square root of a negative number. You can do complex numbers in, in LabVIEW, but you'd have to set it up to do so. So those are some, some other errors that you may come across. So do check for unexpected infinite values or nan values in your mathematical operations. So error handling. So no matter how confident you are in the VI you create, you cannot predict every problem a user can encounter. Without a mechanism to check for errors, you know only that the VI does not work properly. So error checking tells you why and where errors occur, and it allows automatic error handling and manual error handling. Why is this important? Say you work for uh, Spaceship X, whose all their aircraft run off LabVIEW, so it's all done with LabVIEW software, okay, the control <coughs> systems. Say you're, you're going to launch the rocket, okay, and there's an error, right? You want to be really safe, right? You want to make sure if there's an error that you don't continue with the launch. And you can do that programmatically. You can set, you can set up your software and your program so that it will shut down according to the same steps. The same if you're designing a nuclear reactor, right? There's a series of steps that you want to do. So with error handling, you can facilitate that function rather than having relying on an operator to do the right thing. You know, get the, the notebook out, right, what steps do I want to do? Okay, the rocket's crashed. That's a problem. Okay, so we can set it up to do it automatically. So LabVIEW automatically handles any known error when a VI runs by suspending the execution, highlighting the sub-VI or function where the error occurred, and displaying the error dialog box. So select file, VI properties, and select execution from the category pull-down menu to disable automatic error handling for specific VIs if you want to. Okay, so this illustrates I'm hovering over an error handler box here. And there's two important wires that you can see here. And that's the error in, the, the solid orange one at the bottom left, okay, orange and black dashed, and the error out. And in lab view, you can set the order that things execute by using error handling wires. So later on in the course, we're going to see why this becomes quite important to use the error handling. But all you need to know at the moment is that these is error handling clusters. Okay? It's called a cluster and not a wire because it contains more than one data type. In fact, it contains three types of data. It contains a code, so a numeric value. Okay? It con contains a, uh, a text, a string, which gives you um, details about what it is, and it contains a Boolean to say, is there an error or isn't there an error? So use the error cluster controls and indicators to create error inputs and outputs in sub-VIs. The error in and out clusters include the following components of information. So the status, which is the Boolean, the true or false, a code, which is a 32-bit signed integer that identifies the, the code. Usually when I get one of these and I run it, I just go to Google and go LabVIEW code, whatever, and it'll give me a web page that tells me what the problem is. And also the source, which is a string that identifies the error that has occurred. Okay, we'll just have to skip through these. So last part of the lecture then. So last type of structure that we're going to look at, and this is case structures. And the idea that we use a case structure is when we may want to write a program 
But depending on what the value that we've measured is, we may want to do one of two things. So the first thing we may want to do is switch off, stop engines of the rocket. The second thing that we might want to do is to launch it. And we can set that up programmatically using these things called case structures. So this is a case structure. It looks a little bit like a wire loop and a for loop. So it's a box that drops down in the background here. And you'll see at the top in the middle there, there's a drop down menu, and this is displaying the true. Okay? This is a Boolean, okay, a Boolean case structure. I know it's a Boolean, because on the left hand side of my case structure, the little question mark is green. Green means Boolean, so it's a Boolean case structure, which means the case has two bits of code in it. We are currently looking at the true case. Imagine I've got my code on my true case here. Now imagine that I want to execute the other code. It's just like flipping over a piece of paper. So you've got code on either side, and depending on whether the, 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 the question mark on the left-hand side there depending on whether a true or false value goes in there, it's going to say, execute this code or execute this code. That's all a Boolean case structure is. But it's quite powerful programmatically. What's this piece of code doing? Well, there's a number that I'm setting on my front panel. It's saying, is that number greater than or equal to zero? If it is, it's going to be true, and it's going to do the square root of it. If it isn't, it's going to do something else, and I can't see what that is. But we could have a look at that. The way I would look at it is I would click the top here and I'd click false or I'd click true. Okay? Here we're just doing some stuff where we're collecting some data, but you can just see on the left hand side I've just got a Boolean case structure. Are you, are you two okay? Excuse me. Are you both okay? Yeah? First warning. Next time I'll send you out. Okay? So, here we can see we've got two cases, a true or a false, and I've got different code in each of them. This is the true case, the case selector label. This is the selector terminal, okay, that says which piece of code we're going to do. And um, there's different types of case structure. We've just seen a Boolean one. You can also have a numeric one. Now, if you've just got two pieces of code you want to do, the true or the false, great, Boolean will work. But if you've got multiple ones and you want to be able to do multiple things, then you can have an, an integer case structure. And that means that, say, you wanted to do five different things, depending on what the program is doing. You can do that. In fact, you could do hundreds of different things. Okay, it might be quite long to write the program, but this would enable you to do that. So we can set that, set that up to as a numeric code. Um, again, this is a, uh, an input and output tunnels. So again, this is a Boolean case structure. Now look at the right-hand side here. At the top output terminal there, the tunnel, that's a sorry, solid orange colour. And that means that a value is being output from that in every case. Okay, let's go back to my piece of paper example. That means something is wired to that tunnel on this piece of code and in this piece of code. What's illustrated here at the bottom from the multiplier tunnel, it's an, a blue box with a white inside. And that means in one of my case structures, in one of those pieces of code, I've not wired to it. And your code won't run because you have to wire something to every single case. Okay? This is probably really quite important for you for the group project to understand this. Okay? It's quite a common error that you'd see. So straight away, if you see case structure, look on the right-hand side, look at the tunnels and say to yourself, Am, am I going to have any, any problems here? Okay, so default types of data. Uh, numeric, a numeric case structures zero. What does this mean, the default case? That means if I don't tell it which case to execute, say I make a mistake, which one will it do by default? So for a numeric, it will do case zero. For a Boolean, it will do case false. And for a string, it will do empty. Okay? And this is important. So say you've done a numeric one and you've got five pieces of code, five different things that you want to do, but somebody on the front panel inserts a six. There's no sixth piece of code that you want to do, so it has to know which one to do. So it would do the default one, which would be zero. So it's a little safety feature. Let's have a look then. So this is a case structure, and this time in the case structure, I've just cut this slide so you can see the code that I've written in the true case, and the code that I've written in the false case, yeah? 
So the code in the true case, the code in the false case. And in one of them, I'm just going to add two numbers together. In the other one, I'm going to subtract two numbers. So now at this end of this lecture, you could all write a simple program, okay, which could take two numbers and using an integer case structure, you could do a calculator that adds two numbers, subtracts two numbers, multiplies two numbers, or divides two numbers. You could set that up programmatically here. So straight away, pretty, pretty powerful stuff. Um, add a case for each integer as necessary. Integers without a defined case use the default case. So this just illustrates here at the top here, case zero, and it's telling me that that's my default case. If you want to change it, you can right click and you can make one of the other ones a default. The sensible thing to do for safety is usually to make your default case when you're designing things that are you know, safety critical, you can set them up so it will do the shutdown. So if something goes wrong, it will do the shutdown. That's really quite important. How are we doing on the slides? Am I finished? Almost finished. Okay. So case structures. So this is a string case structure. I know it's a string because the little question mark is a pink color, and that means it's a string, text-based data. We okay? Yeah, cool. Uh, monitor's gone out. Okay, other one. So sorry, enum. We we'll remember from last time an enum. Remember an enum. It has a integer value and it also has a string value. Do you remember we talked about enums when we talked about the date, the date and of the year? Yeah. So January would be would be one, and also Jan. The two are coupled to each other. Okay. Um, case structures and error handling. If I ha if I put my error cluster to a, a, a cluster like this, we can see that there's an error or no error. So you can set it up, if you've got an error, to do something programmatically that you would like it to do. So all the safety features that you may want. Okay, case structures, I'll put that example online for you because I think I've just about run out of time. Are there any questions? Tell me, sir. Okay. So you can, yeah, if you've got Windows 11, I'm sorry, only works on Windows 10 PCs. Um, if you use any of the clusters in MACD, they all have LabVIEW on them. Okay? Hold on, hold on, hold on, listening, please. Go on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. If you do the lectures, you engage with all the materials, you'll be absolutely fine with the, with, with the exam. Next week, this brings me on nicely, thanks for the question. Next week, there's no lecture. Next week is your lab. Your lab counts for 10% of the unit. Okay? It's a pass or fail lab. If you complete the activities and you've attended, you get all of the marks. Please attend. This will also help you put into pra We okay? Please, please don't make me shout because I've got, I've got an awful flu and I'll lose my voice. I'll wait for you to finish. Okay, thank you. So, please do attend the lab. It's pass or fail. Don't worry about it. I'm not going to ask you horrible questions to try and trick you and deceive you and cheat you out of your 10%. It's not like that, okay? 